Your fire fall, fall on us. Your fire fall on our lives. Reveal Your glory, Lord. Your glory now. With my desires and wonders. Hallelujah. Father has made it, the living God who we call Father, has made it known to all men His amazing love for each and every single person. He made that love on a level that Really, few can even comprehend, if any. The love that we see when God commanded Abraham to take Isaac, his only begotten son, and go and offer him up. And of course, Father was looking to see if someone would go all the way with him. And Abraham was willing. But a father's love for his son is probably the most overwhelming emotion in relationship known to man. But God had so revealed himself to Abraham and because Abraham was willing to obey God and let him. He came to know Father in such a way that there was nothing that he wouldn't do for this one who was so full of loving kindness, tender mercy, and goodness. So he knew, his, he knew no matter what he was safe obeying God because he realized first and foremost this life isn't limited to the physical life that we're living right now, this temporal existence. He knew that life in God expanded out beyond all comprehension of time. We can refer to it as eternal. Because he's lacked another word to describe it. Forever and forever. Everlasting. Age without end. All the various terms. Hallelujah. He knew that his soul was kept safely in the one who he had come to have a relationship with. And God in his same loving kindness and tender mercy is knocking at the door of your heart right now because he wants to have a relationship with you. Jesus said, Behold, let's stand at the door and knock. And he's, he's talking to me. He's talking to you. He's talking to every person, every soul that has ever lived. He said, If any man will open up the door, this is the problem. This is the issue. So many people are stuck and trapped in religious ideas that they think they opened the door, but they didn't. And then, of course, the fruits of their life expose that. I mean, when you know how much God is in control, there is absolutely no way that you try to manipulate and handle things ever again. Because he's God. When God is re in reality God, then you know he's got the absolute authority and control over everything. And then when you get, add to that that he loves you so much that he gave something more. Father gave something more to us that he could have given of himself. You must understand. Somebody said, well, why didn't Father God come? Why didn't God Almighty himself come, the Father come? Why did he send his only begotten son? Because it was a greater expression of his love. It was just a greater expression of his love. Because as a father, I know that I give my life for my son at any, at any moment, at any time. I know if I stood in a position and I had to offer up my life, or the life of my son, I would offer up my life. It would be much easier for me. It would be less a price to pay. So Father, the Almighty God, took His Word. And that's the only way we can describe Him. Because these things we can't really fully understand right now. No one can. But He took His Word, which was always with Him and hid with in His bosom as... John said in the Gospel of John. And 
He worked a miracle so that God, the Word, was made flesh. See, when you and I, when we were born, that's the first moment of our lives. That's the first moment of our forever. That's the beginning of everything that we are when we were born. God placed within the framework this beautiful relationship that's incomprehensible between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, the ability to create something that never existed before but will last forever and forever. <laughs> but Christ Jesus, who was the Word, who was the Word and who is the Word, who was God and is God. One day, Father worked a miracle. Almighty God worked a miracle so that God could take on fleshly robes, earthly robes, one who's always existed, who never had a beginning, was born of a woman laid in a manger. And all heaven opened up and, and the shepherds tending their flocks heard, Glory to God in the highest. <laughs> Hallelujah. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, Christ the Savior. The goodwill message, the good news message to everybody, God came manifested in the flesh for the person purpose of personally introducing you to the goodness and the glory of Almighty God. What an amazing love. So that you and I could know Him better than Abraham knew Him. You could be seated. We're just, listen, we're just glad you're here. And we want to introduce you to a realm. We want to introduce you to a realm that many Christians don't know anything about. And people look at me and go, well, my goodness, what does he talk about? Well, I'm talking about those kinds of scriptures that you read in the Bible, if you've ever read the Bible. <laughs> Where that when you taste, taste of the goodness of God, when you begin to interact with Him, out of your life begins to flow inexpressible, inexhaustible, unlimited issues of the divine person of Almighty God. And He describes it like rivers. We're here to introduce you to that realm. Now, the good news is that the beginning is when you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, He transforms, He gives you a new heart and a new spirit so you can get started. And so if you would just today decide that you're going to turn your life over to the living God, someone who loves you so much it goes beyond any love that you've ever had for yourself or any love that anybody else has ever had for you because no one died for you like that. No one, no one left all of His riches and all of His glory personally for you to become what Jesus Christ became to ultimately suffer the rejection and to suffer all of the things that, of course, men in this world, all they really know how to do is, is pretty much break covenant and abuse one another. And, you know, people don't know how to live. Man, man doesn't understand how to live in a love relationship. Jesus came to show us how. So just because he was one walking in that glorious love of God, no one could understand where on earth he was coming from. He's come to introduce to you a love that will captivate your soul more and more every day until that, until that you find yourself literally, as it were, translated over into a realm of glory, no longer of this world, but of him, belonging to a place that is far superior to the life that men's been living. living and it simply starts with a request where you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and say, Christ Jesus, living God, or Lord Jesus, or just Jesus, come, change me. Come, take your wonderful, precious, life-giving blood and cleanse me from all of my sins. Wash me and make me new. Holy Spirit, come, overwhelm me with your presence and bring forth that new creation in my life. You may not even begin to understand all the things that I said. You don't even have to say it that way. All you got to do is call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and all those things will just happen. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? it? Truly is. Once again, we welcome all of you here. We're glad that you're here. Um, we're, we're having an, uh, uh, an in-reach today right after the meeting. 
we pray that, that you'll be able to stay around and, and that you'll enjoy the things that are going to happen right after this morning service is over. I want to bring to everyone's attention here, this is an offering envelope. And we want to encourage you that if you believe in what God's doing here in this ministry and you want to be a part of it, you can sow in to the ministry through this, uh, what we call a building fund. And so the cards are made available, I think they're right there at the entryway. And so you can get one before you go out and we'll just probably have somebody pass them out. Once somebody pass those, can you, anybody want one of these? Anyone, just hold your hands up and I just have somebody pass these out. A couple folks just pass these out real quickly. And, you know, folks give in to a lot of things. They give in to their mortgage. They give in to their car payments. They give in to uh, their vacations. They give to a lot of things for their own self-interest. But when you begin to start making the things of God your interest and your purpose, suddenly you hit on the gold mine. Suddenly you hit, you, you touch a realm where now the Lord begins to supply to you more than you ever could possibly even imagine to have. And it's beginning with just the, the riches of responsibility as a steward of the kingdom of God. <laughs> and, of course, then the Lord says also that he'll take and he'll multiply things for you. And it's not just limited to finances, but he takes the seed and he multiplies it. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. He multiply your life. You get to start following Jesus in many ways with your finances. In many ways, that's where you begin with God and surrendering over your life to him because your money is very important to you. You may not realize that, but it is. And of course, you know, if you've never called upon the name of the Lord Jesus, maybe you don't even know why you're here. Maybe you don't even know why you're listening right now on the web, or on this YouTube. Look, the first thing that the Lord wants, He just wants your love. Somebody say, just give your heart to the Lord. Well, what does that mean? Give Him give Him your love. But I mean, when we say give your heart, or when we say give your love, we're talking about, listen, just respond to all that He's done for you and me. Look at the price He paid to get you where you're at right now. Uh-huh. Look at the price that God was willing to pay where Jesus left all of his glory and left all of his riches. <laughs> wow, just for me. You know, and I know he did it for you, but I know first that he did it for me. I, I can't really know that he did these things for you until I first know that he did them for me. So knowing Jesus isn't about a bunch of religious ideas to me. It's not about a bunch of religious concepts. God's not into religion. He's not into all the ritual and, you know, all the exact wordings. He's not into that. He's into the heart. He's not into the intellectual realm. He wants to know, how do you feel about me? And so one of the first places we begin to express how we feel about the Lord is the way that we begin to give of our lives. And one of the things that are probably most outstanding about our lives that we hold and cherish uh, the most uh, dearest to ourselves <laughs> is our money. Now, somebody said, well, no, that's not true. Oh, yeah, it is true. <laughs> because money equals food. Huh? M m money equals clothing. M money equals house. M money equals how to sustain my life. Right? And the Lord says, no, 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 no. I'm going to be something better to you than money. I'm going to be better, something better to you than cloth, clothing. I'm going to be something better to you than food. I'm going to be something better to you than a house. I'm going to give you everything that I possess. I'm going to be, I'm going to give you my life. And I'm going to take perfect care of you now and throughout the ages to come. Then he gives us some proof. Somebody said, how do I know? He says, consider the grass of the field. Consider the earth. Who clothes it with the, with the grass that it's clothed with? Have you ever seen a, you know, a lot or a big piece of land and it was plowed under or it was scraped worse than that? Plowed under doesn't really, isn't too bad, but it's scraped. No grass on it. Some people run a bunch of dozers over top of it. That's a pathetic, naked-looking piece of ground. 
Huh? No life in it, just dirt. Jesus looks at you and me and says, consider what I've done for the ground. I've clothed it with grass. And then he, then he beautified it. He didn't sleep with grass. And he, then he put an arrangement of flowers. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ha, ha, ha. And then he says, think about how much it costs to take care of all the fowl of the air, all the birds. None of them are lacking. Think about all of the creatures on the face of the earth right now, how well he's providing for and taking care of them. He said, you're much more important to me than them. Don't you think I'm going to take care of you? Oh, when you begin to, when you begin to inch out of holding on to your own life, you begin to inch away from having to take care of yourself and nobody cares about you but your, you know, but you. And if you don't take care of you, who will? And it consumes the interest. It really does. This the, you don't know this probably because your mind will play tricks on you. But your own self-interest consumes your thoughts from the time you wake up in the morning till you go to bed and then you dream about you. Notice, you don't spend your day thinking about President Obama or uh, Governor Brown or your neighbor down the street. You wake up every morning concerned with you. There is a walk with God where you wake up every morning captivated by Him. Living in a realm. It, it's going to get tough for you there because you're going to look around and go, what on earth is everybody else doing with themselves? Can't they understand? Can't they know? He's the doorway into this realm of glory. All they've got to do is say goodbye to themselves. You know, and I preached for, I've been preaching for 35 years, pastoring this church for 30 And the one earnest thing that God, the Holy Ghost, has constantly inspired me with and filled me with a passion and a zeal for is just to see people get happy and rejoice and joy in Christ Jesus and live in this wonderful realm of God where they easily walk away from sin and all self-interest and the pride of life. There's so many people captivated by the pride of life and I can prove to you that it is the basis and means of every murder, every hateful crime, every war, every violent act. But yet people still are consumed by it. I got a better realm to live in. We're calling you to come and go with us. Jesus Christ is the door. He opens up a way into the presence of the Father that will absolutely take everything about your life and redefine it. You don't have to live worried about yourself anymore. Concerned about yourself. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have a dear friend and God has used them in amazing ways. He's from Argentina, South America, and he was a businessman, and he was always captivated by fear. How is he going to take care of his children? What if his business failed? Always overwhelmed by the cares of this life. One day, the power of God came and touched him. And he was overwhelmed by the life and the peace that the Holy Spirit brought All the fear exited his life. He cared no longer for his life. He was captivated by the living God who cared more for his life than he ever cared for his life and had an encounter with God in such a way that he was convinced. Today, we want you to be convinced. You'll never be sad again. You'll never be disappointed again. You'll never be discouraged again. Well, not if you are, not for long. Maybe, you know, I used to tell people, you can be disappointed and discouraged for 10 minutes. But after you grow a little while, then you got to reduce it to five minutes. And most people that have been around me, they're not allowed to be discouraged or disappointed more than 30 seconds. Then you have to have enough wisdom and insight to recognize that that is a lie, that that is holding on to your own life. And if you hold on to your own life, you're going to lose it. That is a place where you crossed over. You don't trust God at that moment. You're not willing to lift up your hands and begin to praise Him who knows far more than you know. (laughs) He knows the beginning from the end. You barely know where you are at right now. Is it true? It's true. God loves us so much. And what happens is 
When we hold on to ourselves, we hold on to everything that we have. And we, we think, you know, we begin to talk about building fun. We begin to talk about offering. The Lord says, come and worship me with the offering. Every offering in the Bible spoke of Jesus. Paul said he was the shadow. Or rather that he was the, that everything that happened in the Old Testament was a shadow. But Christ Jesus is the image. Everything in the Old Testament was a shadow of Christ Jesus who is the very body and image for which that shadow was cast. So every offering, every act of worship, every act of praise, it was all about Jesus. When you get, begin to give of your offering, when you begin to give of your life, you're making, it's all, you're making it all about Jesus. It's all about that offering that God gave. It's in remembrance of the offering. They had a remembrance or a, for, a, a, a looking forward to and a remembrance of the offering that God would bring in the future. Christ Jesus. We have a remembrance now of the offering that God brought to us 2,000 years ago. And every offering is about Jesus Christ. Every offering is a memorial offering. And we'll go on forever. There will be an offering, a memorial offering, a remembrance offering of what Jesus did for us. And, we'll, and the more we participate about it, with it, the more we get excited about it. And here's why. Because we begin to recognize it was all done just for me. He did it all for me. I see people going and tell other people about the things of the kingdom of God and they really aren't convinced themselves about who they are in God. And when you do, when you become convinced, become convinced of His love for you, great security comes into your life. Great confidence. Now you're willing, truly willing to go wherever He asks you to go, do whatever He asks you to do. Be whatever He wants you to be. Say whatever He wants you to say. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. If I, could, if, I, if I had enough of a voice to shout right now, I'd start screaming. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! Yeah! laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Paul said our offerings were like a, an offering of a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. Everything that is given is all about that offering that God gave so that all men could be redeemed. I want you to, if you have a Bible, I want you to open up your Bible to Romans chapter 5 and verse 21. Now, I'm going to preach today and I'm going to believe God that the things that are sick about you will be healed. Huh? Now, 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 listen to me. I, I, know, that there, I know that one person has a need in their family that is here. God's going to heal. God, when I was standing, I was standing in a, in a, in a crusade one night, about 40,000 people in Papua New Guinea. So on a Friday night, and I stepped up on the platform. I said a few things and the power of God swept the place and just asked everybody to raise their hands and as we did miracles started happening and the first miracles that started taking place is young children who had never spoken in their life some as old as 10 years of age begin to speak and I'll tell you right now when those things happen you, you don't have to just have a little testimony when mom's sobbing and trembling and said my child's 10 years old and never spoke a word and now they're talking hey listen the Lord's come to heal you what's ever sick about you Huh? He's just coming to you what they were sick about you. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you were paraplegic today, you'd be very interested in Jesus healing whatever's sick about you. Huh? If, you had, if you had a death sentence of cancer eating up your body, you'd be so, oh, could he possibly come to heal me, to heal the sickness and this disease of my body? You'd be interested. The Lord wants us to heal those things that are sick about you within the framework of the way you think the way that you live your life. He's come to heal you. People don't like to be told that they're sick because the pride of life says, I'm not sick, I'm whole. I'm better than you. Uh -huh. There's always the competition. No competition in the kingdom of God doesn't exist. It exists in the realm of darkness. And the Lord's come to deliver you and me out of that and to take us and lead us in the right way and give us the right heart. Listen, people, people today, our culture, they give a lot of rewards to, to, to intellectualism and to how much you know. But with Father, 
The intellect isn't a big deal. The virtue is a big deal. Our culture doesn't reward virtue. You're not going to get paid more money for virtue. You gotta, you're going to get paid more money for what you know and what you're willing to do to get whatever, to do whatever it takes to get whatever you want in the realms of this world. The Lord just called us to come into a place of being, of being meek, of being broken, of walking in humility, of saying, lead me, Lord, teach me, of being overwhelmed with love and loving people. <laughs> I mean, he, he, his call to us is, he, he says to us, he says, he says to love your enemies. He says, well, it, salute those who hate you. Say hello to them, in other words. I mean, if you begin to participate with these kinds of things, it is going to be an evidence that what was sick in you got healed. The sickness in you that wants to fight and fuss and be critical and, and, and be a part of all these things that go on in the framework of men, of broken relationships and covenant breaking. Many people don't even have, many people don't stay in the, the same church for five years. Many people only stay in the same church for one year. So why? Because they, they're going to be all excited at first, but it ain't going to take long. Satan's going to sort them out, and the things that are sick in them are going to sort them out, and they're going to leave because they're going to have problems with everybody. Or at least significant folks. Huh? People don't have the same friends they had five years ago. It's rare. I mean, to grab a hold of your friends and cherish them and understand that, you know, you're going to work through the bad and you're going to work through all the issues and you're going to love them and, and you're going to be the friend that's going to help them through all of their abuses of you. It's all fine until somebody starts abusing you. All right? Jesus took all our abuses. So we could step into his life. <laughs> Isn't that good? good? It's true now. It's true. And he says, come follow me. People say, I'll follow you. It just until somebody does something I don't like. And then I'm not going to follow you anymore. I'm going to go follow the other guy. And then I'll regroup with you after we're done with this problem. And then we're going to follow you until we have another issue. Well, I want you to look with me in Romans chapter 5 and verse 21. I want to show you a whole other way of living. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 21, Paul said concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and concerning of the condition of men, he says, Now that as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. Sin reigned over men. And that's our culture's. That's what men have been taught about. That's what men believe in. They believe in the things that, um, that are taught to them in, in the home, early in life. They believe in the things that they learn in preschool, kindergarten, elementary school things they learned on the playground, the things they learned in the neighborhood, the things they learned in junior high school, in high school, and then all the experiences of life that surrounded that and all the interests that men pursue in an everyday existence in this world. And all of that's been taught by one who is the prince of the power of the air, the god of this world, the spirit of disobedience that's right now working among, among men. And Paul's describing this at this moment in this verse of Scripture as the power of sin. And the power of sin has a death reign. And so therefore, everything that is going on in your life produces death and destruction, broken relationships, hurt, heartache, discouragement, disappointment, the pursuit of one's own self-interest that ultimately leads to nowhere. And, uh, of course, Paul's going to say it again at the end of the next chapter. He's going to say the wages of sin, Romans 6, 23. He's going to say the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is an unlimited, immeasurable life. If I could just, if I could just convince you today that this is the greatest piece of information 
This is the greatest wisdom and insight that anyone could give you. And you would say, oh, okay, I'm going to live by this. If I told you today that I've discovered a way for you to make $10 billion over the next year, and all you have to do is grab a hold of one simple principle, I'd have everybody coming to the class. <laughs> And especially if I had the $10 billion deposited in my bank account and could show them the receipt of deposit. And they're all looking at that going, what? You, did you just did this to get that? And then you're telling me all I got to do is these things? You're kidding me. No, I'm not kidding. You just do these things. You get this that I have in Christ Jesus. You get this realm of divine favor, this realm of divine glory. You get this wonderful thing called unlimited, immeasurable, abundant. <laughs> you get divine healing, <laughs> divine health, hallelujah, yeah. divine blessings, divine provision, <laughs> divine protection, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> you get a play, a divine protection. Satan can't sort you out. You have been sorted out and you separated unto the, <laughs> unto the Lord. I've been going to the same church for 35 years. Me too. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm in the, I'm, I belong to the church that is written in heaven. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I belong to the church. I'm in the same church Paul's in. I'm in the same church Peter started and John started. I'm the same church that Jesus started. Same church that all the 120 on the day of Pentecost were in. I'm in that church. Hallelujah. Right now, I am. People look at me and go, I am. I'm in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, purchased with the blood, filled with His holiness. Uh, uh, literally an altar made by God to offer sacrifices of praise unto the living God. What a blessing. And I've got proofs for it. And I'm telling you, if you took a hold of these principles that I'm talking to you about right now, it is simply recognizing that all that is in the world, all, the, all that, that sin produces will only result in you being sick. And it will be a sickness unto death. And all, your, all, all of your bright decisions and all of your insightful conclusions will result in your own destruction. They will not result in your life. But, but, now, because of what Jesus did for you and me, now sin isn't reigning. Rather, grace is reigning right now. In other words, the reign of Christ Jesus, the reign of the Holy Spirit, the reign that Paul talked about in, uh, in to Titus when he said the grace of God has appeared and teaches all men right now to deny worldliness and ungodliness. He's come to show us how to live out this life. Uh, turn with me quickly to Psalms chapter 20, uh, Psalms 25. Yeah, let's go there. One of my favorite psalms, of course, they're all my favorite psalms. But uh, listen to this in verse, let's say, I think it's verse 8. Are you turning there? Psalm 25, 8. Look you over here. It says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. Isn't that amazing? Sin ultimately reigned and it produced death in everyone and they were separated from God and they couldn't know God and they couldn't be taught by God and they couldn't be led by God. But Jesus comes on the scene and we read in John chapter 10, He says, I am the door. Nobody can come in lest they walk through Me. He comes to us at the end of it all when He's addressing the churches as, as the Bible age is closed in the sense of those documents that would be contained in the world word of God and he says behold I stand at the door of your life I'm banging on your heart right now open it up not come in fellowship with you the Lord's just looking for just a little crack of the door and once you just crack the door you'll see him you opened all the way up yeah. hallelujah hallelujah Oh, I pray today that you will recognize that right now the goodness of God and the grace of God is such that the Holy Spirit drew you here. 
You have an opportunity to come. And what's going to happen is Satan is going to do everything he can do. The power of sin that still works right now is going to do everything that they can do to separate you and to stop you from coming. Because if you walk all the way with God, if you're willing to be taught with Him, by Him on a daily basis, He is the truth. He is the life. He is the way. He will establish every good and perfect thing in your life. And I'm going to tell you, it will produce every wonderful blessing that you can imagine. Because the Lord has given to us where there was the wages of sin that produced death. Hallelujah. He has given to us something so much beyond all that we could think or ask. The gift of God. The gift of God is fundamentally expressed in the giving of a new life. In the giving of a new heart. In the giving of a new spirit. The gift of God is expressed. When, he, when Jesus talked to the woman at the well. And said if you understood the gift of God. You'd ask me and I would give you to drink. And there would be a wellspring springing up on the inside of you. Of all the life and the same kind of things. That God Almighty himself experiences and feels and lives in. Father knows what's going on in your life right now. He sees the sickness of your life. And of your spirit. He sees how Satan has oppressed and blinded and brought all kinds of accusations against him and against his anointed. He knows the warfare that rages against you so that you'll never understand what it means to walk through Christ Jesus the door and come in and find this realm of living, find this place of great provision that Jesus described in John chapter 10 as pastures. Places that, I mean, when you've got a beautiful pasture, I know most of you don't understand that because you've raised in the city and all you basically haven't really known much beyond the four walls of the concrete jungle. But when you've got nice pasture, when you've got, <laughs> when you've got nice streams and springs flowing into that pasture and you take and you let your sheep out or you let your cattle out, they've got everything that they need. It is, it's heaven. It's heaven. We, Ann and I, we had our horses here in California for a while. And uh, because of the confined area of California, we had to put them in these pens. And we had, they had some pretty good sized pens. But my, when we took them up to the pastures that the Lord provided for us up in the state of Oregon, and they were led out into like a thousand acres of pasture. Those horses were in grass way up past their belly, and they were standing there salvating with grass filled in their mouth, and they were in heaven. They had everything they could ever want. There was water flowing by. There was provision unlimited. They can't run out. That's what Father says to you and me. That's what Jesus says. He said, everybody else, they thieves and they liars. Oh, Jesus, why did you mess you? What are you, what are you saying? And then they get into their mind trying to file that. And they're thinking, were well, you saying Moses is a liar? Because they, they don't hear his words of life. they all caught up in the, in the realms of what they know and what they think. And they can't allow the anointing to open up to them a whole new dimension of wisdom and understanding. He said, oh, come before me are thieves and liars. They sought their own interests. I am the way. I am the truth. If any man comes to the Father by me, he shall come in and he shall find all these wonderful things. Now I'm inserting of what those things mean that pertain to life and godliness, glory and virtue, great provision and peace, peace and abundance, uh, Joy in abundance. Life in abundance. People say, well, I have this problem, that problem, this disaster, and that disaster. God's trying to get you out of that, this problem, that problem, this, this disaster, and that disaster. He's been dealing with you. Oh, well, I love God. Well, He wants you to love Him more. He wants to heal you of your sickness and your disease. And so what does He do? Jesus said, I've come. Jesus, here's Jesus. I've come. I came to call sinners to repentance and here he is here's the goodness of god verse 8 god who is righteous upright the lord there he will teach sinners in the way that's what he's doing he, but here here's the people that are going to respond to him the meek those people who aren't are going to be defenseless they they're not going to get in 
They're not going to try to defend themselves and uphold themselves. And we look at who meek, what meek is and what meek looks like. Moses was meek. Moses was meek because here his sister and his brother saying, hey, look, he's not the only one that knows what's, what's going on. Besides that, he stammers every once in a while. He's not a very, you know, he's not a very presentable guy. He says the same thing about Paul. He's weighty in his letters, but when in presence, he's contemptible. Huh? They don't, because they define things in a wrong realm. And so they come along and, and, and Miriam and, and, and Aaron's trying to bring accusation against Moses. And what does he do? He doesn't say anything. He's just like, no, whatever. And the Lord says, he's the meekest man in all of the earth. Because he just, he just doesn't, have, he doesn't have a defensive posture. Huh? And the Lord says, quit being defensive. Quit trying to write excuses for yourself. Quit trying to make up things that will ultimately, you know, put you in a better light. Just, just recognize I'm here to instruct the meek. I don't care how messed up you are. He's good in this upright. He will lead and guide sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment. And the meek will he teach his way. People, just, just, just understand. You're going to school, many of you, so that you can learn how other people got to the level of success that they achieved. But that's only temporal. And you may get there and you may not. You may learn everything in the classroom and it not result in any great breakthrough for you. But God says, I've come here personally to be your teacher and your mentor, to show you my ways of life, to instruct you in every good thing. And so many people just want religion. They don't want the relationship that only comes because you're willing to fully turn your life over to him. And you say, Lord, ha, 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 you got me. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'm telling you, I'll get on an airplane right now. I'll go to the Himalayas. I'll go to Tibet. I'll go to the jungles of Irianjaya. I'll go, I'll go to San Diego. <laughs> ha, 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 I'll, go to, I'll go to this place called Scripps Ranch. I'm not a city guy. This isn't my element. I'm a country bumpkin. I love the wilderness. I love vast expanses of empty land and trees and eagles and rivers and streams and cattle and, and mountain lions and bears. I love that stuff. That's my, that's my kind of living horseback up into the mountains with a pack mule and hunting. Come on. That's my life. If I were living my life, you would never know me or see me because I would be so far back out there in the wilderness. You'd have to get lost to find me. I go anywhere he wants me to go. I'm living for a life that expands way beyond this temporal existence. I've found that I can fully trust him. He's going to take good care of me. He's going to bless me with total abandonment, live for him. Now, if I were out there living where I would have lived if I chose my own life, I'd be sad and miserable. You know why? Because I'd feel the tugging of the Lord saying, come follow me. <laughs> I'd just walk around crying. Ah! <laughs> I'd walk around broken. Ah, Lord, all I want to do is do the things that you want me to do. He said, get back to San Diego. <laughs> Stay, stand there. Stand there and speak all these words of life. Regard not their faces or their opinion or what they think. Lift up your voice and call all men. Come and fellowship with me. Leave their life that they know behind. Find a full break with all those things that you've been taught are good. Once again, from the time you're in your home, preschool, kindergarten, elementary, junior high, high school, all the influences surrounding that, and then as you've advanced more in life, all of that has nothing to do with God. It's nothing to do with the Father. That all of those things right now are under the reign still of sin. They're under the reign of the power of sin that all produces death. But over here in this wonderful realm which Christ Jesus has prepared 
for all mankind when He raised from the dead. It's a realm of grace He calls all men to come. Come over here. Here's God standing, as it were, on the other side of the flood. On the other side of a great gulf that has separated humanity from Him. He's crying out, come over here. And by a miracle translation, those who say, I want to come. I want to be taught of God. I want to learn the great and high ways, the ways that last forever, the ways that cause me to slip out of this life into the other. See, when Ruthiana is singing that song this morning, some people think, well, you know, she's talking about dying. Well, a different kind of dying. A dying where we were crucified with Christ and we no longer live. And we slipped into another life. It's life where we now live in Christ Jesus and find these green pastures (laughs) where He leads us beside still waters, where He restores our soul. He heals everything about our life. So So it's like that which He first intended when He formed Adam from the fine dust of the earth. and Breathed. Into his breath. Breathe into his nostrils. This breath of life. Breathe in right now. Go. Breathe in. Now breathe out. God gave you that. It was passed to you through a divine miracle of conception. Huh? It was only activated when you left the belly and came out into this place that we call life. Around by the living. No man can activate that. No science can, no science can bring that to pass. They might be able to describe certain things about it, but in reality, some of the very most fundamental things science can't explain. Engineers can creatively understand everything about the dimensions of a bird's aerodynamics, but it's when its final conclusion, they can't even begin to see how it's possible that that thing can fly like it flies. It's impossible. Because it's all living by the very power of God. And everything's doing what it's doing by His command. (laughs) Hallelujah. There's only one realm outside of God. That's polluting and contaminating everything, contaminating everything like a plague and like a disease. And that's that realm of sin. That's that realm of darkness. That's that realm of chaos. That's that realm that is empty and void and desolate. And all we're doing is calling people out of that realm in such a way to where you have no more effect by that realm or effect of that realm. (laughs) No more influence from that realm. No more attachment to that realm. No mobility for that realm to reach out and grab you and pull you into itself. Because you appear seated with Christ Jesus in a heavenly place. You entered in through the door, Christ Jesus. And who ha And here we are now with the Holy Ghost. Come lead us, guide us into all truth. Hallelujah. Ah, He come to teach us all the things that belong to God. All the things that belong to Jesus. He comes to transfer them to us. And, And let me finish reading this. The meek will he guide in his judgment. The meek will he teach his ways. All the paths of the Lord, they are mercy, they are truth. And to such as keep his covenant. And to such as keep his covenant. It's covenant. It's a covenant of love and it's a covenant of life. I first and foremost, I have a covenant with Jesus Christ. He has established that covenant. He made it a covenant that I could have with him. He provided the covenant. I stepped into the covenant. I'm not letting go of him. I will not let go of him. And he will not let go of me. If you lay hold on eternal life, who is Christ Jesus, he will not let go of you so long as you don't let go of him. And so long as you put your trust in him, so long as you're willing to be taught of God, the Holy Ghost will bring you into a place of godly sorrow if you're living wrong. And God will bring you to a place of repentance so that you can learn how to live right. So that everything that's sick about you, everything that's diseased in your life, be made whole. I believe with all of my heart that if you could just start in a place where the name of Jesus hasn't been named, some unreached people group, and you start a church and you clearly define the life of God versus the life that belongs to this world, 
the reign of sin versus the reign of grace. And you don't make excuses for sin. And you've got people who are willing to be corrected and you rebuke misbehavior. And they are like meek children who respond to you and say, no, that you're right. Then every one of those people with that new heart and with that new spirit that the Lord has given will grow right and grow proper and they will mature quickly even as those who are under the ministry of Jesus and those who are under the ministry of the apostles who had a sincere and true heart. But now we live in a climate of all of these ideas and all of these opinions and all of these mixtures. Of course, the Word of God is plain and clear concerning what is right and wrong, but yet Satan is a master in his craft and he, and he, and he does and he deceives and he, and, he, and he convolutes it and he, and he mixes it all up. And people are like, that's right. And then every man is turned to his own way. And then every man becomes a ruler by his own judgments and a ruler by his own imaginations of his heart and his own thinking and conclusions. And the, the Lord would lead you in his judgments, the thoughts of his heart's Heart, the way he thinks about things, what he demands. People think that Father is going to just like let everybody have a slide in. You just excuse your misbehavior, your wrongdoing, your participation with the God of this world, living under the reign of sin, participating. Anytime you participate, participate with sin, you empower and give yourself allegiance to that reign of sin. Listen, stop it. Come over here. Look, God will teach you. He'll love you. Just stop it. Say, no more. I want to be taught of you, Lord. I come under your authority. I'll live for you. God, listen, never has there been perilous times as there are today. Never have there been so many seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Never have been, been so arrogant that they despise and, and no longer reverence those authorities which God has placed in His church. Which is far more important than the authorities. That God has placed in the earth. Huh? There are some people, they wouldn't run a red light for nothing in the world. Huh? Because they want to obey the authorities that are in this earth. But they will not show enough respect to a leader in the church to be corrected about the smallest of things. They walk all over the governorship and rulership of God, the governorship and rulership of the Holy Ghost. Don't be that way. Because all you do is you say with your actions, I don't want to be under the reign of the living God. No, but rather with your actions, say, oh God, here am I. Oh God, I mean, you know, you can be like the public and smite his chest and say, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. You know, the Pharisee, you couldn't convince him that he was a sinner. He was righteous because he was righteous by the law. And because he was righteous by the law and because there was a sin sacrifice made on, on the day of purgation, which we call uh, Yom Kippur, or the day of atonement, he's righteous. Jesus said, because you think that, because you're not willing to see the reality of your life and your, and your situation and condition, your sin remains. People tell me all the time, well, can't you change the message, message a little bit? Can't you reduce the message? What, change God's word? Change God's message? What will you then not do? You will allow in the flood of sin and the reign of terror. And it, and, and it, can, be, it, can, it can be made to very, look very, very good. And it's called, it equals religion. It can be made to look very, very good. Well, oh, look at all the good that they're doing. <laughs> you want to go down that road? I, I, can, I can give you some examples that, that, that won't work at all. Look at all the good that they're doing. But I want to finish this first. I want to finish this for you. For the, your name's sake, O oh Lord, verse 11, pardon my iniquity. Pardon it. It's not excuse me, pardon me, because I just burped. Just to be crude for a moment. Huh? It's much different than that. It's erase. Allow me another opportunity. Pardon my iniquity. Forgive me. Wash it away. Cleanse it. Erase it. And now the Lord says, I'm going to make a way. I'll make a way. For 2,000 years, almost, there has not been one sin offering offered in Jerusalem since 70 A.D. 
Not one. The temple has been removed. Recently I discovered a new part of a plan and agreement that they're trying to ultimately get signed by April 14th. April 14th this year. To where they're in a peace agreement with the Palestinians. The Temple Mount would be shared with another temple. That it won't be just the, the mosque that stands there. But once again, a temple raised up. Watch out. You're closer than what you knew. I'm standing here before the judgment seat of Christ right now. I'm not living in my life right now in a temporal existence. I'm living in a realm called heaven. And my words and my life and my conduct and my way, my way of living is being judged by Almighty God now. And I want it to be judged now because I don't want it to be judged later. <laughs> if you corrected now, which all sons are, if you receive correction now, you won't be condemned with the world. The Lord's calling you. He stands here. Christ Jesus said, I love you so much. I paid it all. There's not going to be any excuse. There's not going to be any excuse. Because when somebody starts giving excuses, that you should have lived in San Diego in 2014. You would understand how impossible it would be to live the way you say we're supposed to live. She's going to be standing there going, I paid it all for you. I broke, this, I broke the power of sin. I broke the reign of terror. I, I invited you to come over here and be protected by me, kept by me, live in me. Let me be your savior. Let me be your champion. Let me be your God. But you refused to come. You brought your excuses. We look at the Lord and we say, forgive me my sin and my iniquity. He said, I forgive you. I take my blood, my own life blood that cost me all of the pain and all of the torture and all of the suffering that I went through. And I take it and I give it to you. And I erase your sin by giving you my life. See, the blood transfers the life, you see. Uh, it transfers the life. It doesn't stain you. It transfers the life. It cleanses you. It transfers the life of God right into you because sin produces death. But the life of God transferred right into you overthrows death. It swallows up death with victory. Huh? Life swallows up death and victory over everything that Satan has tried to do to destroy you. Would you take that life? Would you take that life and come live in that life? You take this wonderful power of the Holy Spirit and begin to shine as a light because if there's anything that is needed right now in this world is a church that will rise up with the glory and the brightness and the splendor of the life of God. If there's anything that is needed right now is a light of, of His love and His grace and His mercy and covenant keepers to stand up in the earth right now. People who are hungry and passionate for the things of God who are able to see what Satan is doing and receive power and authority to break off that yoke. The Lord, he's, the Lord says, what man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall, that person that fears the Lord, the Lord will teach his ways that he, God, has chosen. Or teach me the ways you've chosen. We've been taught from birth the ways that men have chosen. Everywhere, all around us is a continual bombardment of all of that. Influence. Separate me. Get me over here in the light. I like to walk over here in the darkness every once in a while, especially at night. Not in this shadow, not in this darkness. Teach me in this light. Teach me in your way. Oh God, I don't want to live over there anymore. I want to live over here in this life that you have chosen. Not in the life that men have chosen for me. The press that men would put upon me. I want you to stand with me. The pressure that men put upon me. And we have many more things like this to say. And we could go on saying these things for the rest of the afternoon. And probably should that we may convince you. But the good news is we'll be back here tonight. Should you be willing to come, we'll be back here tonight. Right around, we can start prayer about 5 o'clock and then we'll have the meeting at 6 o'clock. And for the sick and the diseased, we're going to pray for them. Huh? Those who have sick children, I want you to bring them back tonight. Okay? So that the mute might speak tonight. Those who have friends or people that you know that have some kind of sickness or disease, cancer, they may have glaucoma, 
cataracts, people with diabetes of every different sort and type. We have a cure here tonight for the physical body and a proof of a cure for the spiritual needs. Right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed before the living God, I want you to make a choice today whether or not you choose to give your life over to the one who died for you 2,000 years ago and rose again and now lives, King of kings, Lord of lords, ruler of rulers, Will you turn your life over to Him? Would you be willing to say, My life is completely yours at this moment. Lord Jesus, my life is completely yours at this moment. I call upon you. Come deliver me. Pardon me from my iniquity. Take hold of me and lead me in your way. It's really it's very, very simple. You don't have to call God down because He's already here. You do not have to beg Him to come. He's here. Christ Jesus is here. Christ Jesus is here. And He's calling you. He's standing at the door of your heart and He's knocking right now. And He says, just open up your heart to me. How simple is that? To open up your heart to Him. It's a heart that just says, God, I want to know you. God, I want to serve you. I want to do what's right. I want, to, I, want to, I want to partake of those things that you died at Calvary's cross for me to have that you purchased for me there when you shed your blood that you provided and gave when you rose from the dead. There are those of you here that are standing right now. You've been a perpetual backslider. Every week you backslide. Well, I can understand that maybe for a while, but after years and years of it, something seriously wrong. I've heard many people say, let us lay aside the weight and sin that such does so easily beset us. Well, when are you going to lay it aside? Today, God calls you. There's a grace right now. There's a grace reigning right now. A grace is reigning. Not, not, a, not just a terror of sin, holding all men prisoner. There's also grace now reigning right now, right at this moment, calling all men to come. But if you want to get into it, if you want to get into the program of grace, you've got to be born into it. God wants to work a work for the new birth in you. All you have to do is lift your hands towards heaven. I want everybody in this place to lift your hands towards heaven. I command you in Jesus' name to repent. Right now in the name of Jesus, I break off every claim of Satan from off of you. I open up the prison doors for you and I command you, go free in Jesus' name. No longer will you be held in the prison of idolatry, of Islam, of Buddhism, of, of Hinduism, of cults, of things that are purely religious. I break it today. I break off that yoke in Jesus' name. I set you free in Jesus' name so that you can choose this day to follow Jesus. All you have to do is say yes. All you have to do is say yes. Just a couple of little yeses. Why don't you just go ahead and give a big yes. Yes! How oh, mighty God, I yield myself to you. Lord Jesus, I call upon your name. Say Jesus. Jesus. That's the name above every name. The name of that, the power of that name will destroy every power of sin. Every effect of demon spirits will cure you body, soul, and spirit. Say this, say, I call upon your name. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I call upon your name. Lord Jesus, I call upon your name. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, 
I call upon your name. Lord, wash me in your blood. Lord, cleanse me from my sins. I yield my life to you. I call upon you, Jesus. I call upon you now. We're here to pray with you and for you. If you've never accepted Christ Jesus into your life and you want us to pray with you so that you can be certain that your life is transformed and changed, you come, we'll pray with you. If there's been problems going on in your life, if you, like many people today, have an accusation against a preacher, you've got a stronghold in your life and it needs to be broken because you're not making heaven that way. And I could go all the way down the list. If you've got sin and iniquity going on in your life, habits, addictions, that you know they're wrong and they're continually going on, I'm telling you, that thing has got to be ruined and stopped. Which is only possible through the work of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you're going to die as you have lived in sin. If you want everything about your life to change today, God gives you the opportunity so that from this day forward, you are without excuse. If you sang this song and prayed this prayer with us, as we just sang it, singing, call, Lord, I call upon your name, Lord Jesus. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me from your sin. And you said that in a sincere and in true heart. All heaven has responded. You say, oh God, create a new creation and bring forth a new man with a new heart and a new spirit. One that knows you, loves you, walks with you and is united with you. You don't even have to say all that. God just does it. You call upon the name of the Lord. And then the Lord's commanded us to do this. To teach you to observe all things that He has commanded. That's the next step. To be willing to be taught in the way. Is there anybody here that wants to turn your life over to Jesus? Is anybody here you don't know whether or not you're right with God? You don't know whether you've ever been born again. And let me just tell you this right now. You cannot come into the kingdom of God. You cannot enter in through the door of Christ Jesus unless you're born again. The very act of entering in through that door, you must be born again. Being born again is to say my life is over. I'm not living my life anymore. I'm going to submit to God creating a new me. It's after His image. It's after His righteousness and after His holiness. It's another way of living to be taught now a whole new culture. Culture of the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus.